Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Prime Talk. My name is Lisa Kinski. I'm joined by my co-host, Yoni Mazur. And today we have with us our guest, Stephen Harris. Stephen, how are you? I'm very good. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. So everyone, Stephen is the founder of Citruna, which is a leading global Amazon agency handling logistics and Amazon advertising services for brands, enabling them to reach their full potential on the world's largest marketplace. So Stephen, we're going to talk about Citruna a little bit more at the end of the episode, but this is really going to be your hour. We want to know your story of where you're from, your experiences growing up, your education, your entrepreneurial ventures, and how you got to founding at Citruna. So let's start from the beginning. Where are you from originally? Awesome. Um, yeah, I grew up in, well, I grew up in London, born in London and still live in London. So yeah, London. A London yeah. native. All the way. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> very, very much. Yeah. And when you were growing up, were you an only child, multiple siblings? What was that experience? Yeah, um, I'm really lucky. I've grown up like most of my family were in London as well. So I've got quite a big family. Um, one sister, um, who always knew what she wanted to do from like the age of five or six, um, which was which was great. Um, very different. What did she do? What did she um, do? She's, she's a nurse. So she said when she was like six years old, she wanted to be a nurse. At, um, there's a hospital uh, called Great Ormond Street in London, which is like a really great children's hospital. Um, and she went there as a kid and loved it. I was like, I want to grow up and be a nurse here. And then age of 19, 20, got a job there and has been there ever since. So Aww, nice. that's beautiful. Pretty, pretty amazing. She knew exactly yeah. what she wanted. And it's nice um, that she stuck with it too. I had a friend who always yeah. wanted to be an attorney and then she started pre-law. She was like, oh, I hate <laughs> this. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, that's more like me. <laughs> I think I wanted to work in the White House at one point, which quickly oh. changed that. Well, we'll get there. We'll get there. What did your parents do while you and your sister were growing up? Um, my mum was a teacher. Um, she actually taught at this. She was a, a, like a, a teaching assistant at the school that I went to, the primary school I went to. Um, and my dad had a few different jobs, um, but worked in retail and then retrained to IT um, when I was about 11 or 12. Um, and he actually had a, a very good record of working for a stream of companies that all went bust after he left. Um, but like companies like Blockbuster, and there's a really big one in the UK called Woolworths um, that went bust in the recession and then a few others. So um, his most recent one was a Russian bank he worked for, which obviously now is, has closed down. Um, sure. so, uh, yeah, that, he had a variety of jobs. Mum was always a teacher. Fantastic. And so your sister wanted to become a nurse. And when you were a kid, were you really focused on your studies or playing sports or watching political shows? <laughs> How were you spending your time? The West Wing. You I, probably saw the I West Wing. I did like the West. Yeah, I did love the West Wing. Um, yeah. So, um, I, I mean, I, I didn't not enjoy school. Um, but, uh, uh I uh, didn't kind of clearly know what I wanted to do even until I was sort of like 24, 25 when I, when I started some of my own businesses. Um, enjoyed sport, enjoyed football, never, was never any good, um, but still enjoyed playing it and watching it. Um, well, well, I mean, you're, as a London native, which one's your team, by the way? Top, t definitely Tottenham. Tottenham Hotspur, Tottenham Hotspur, Hotspur yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Very good. Right. That, wasn't a, that was the only thing that wasn't a choice. My family let me choose most things. But <laughs> football, football team was no choice. Yeah, London has a whole variety of teams and it's a kind of a religion almost there. So it's a... It's a yeah, yeah <laughs> very much. I, I will say I did not understand how fervent the English football fan base was until I was in Prague for a show. And there was a we call it soccer there was a soccer game and all of the fans descended on Prague, and you could hear them for miles chanting and i don't know who the teams were but i thought american football fans were intense and we don't hold a candle to english football uh, american football fans are cute but uh the real deal is uh yeah the, the, yeah, the british also... uh, football fans but uh, i think it also got invented the football i mean soccer was invented in england also so for them it's you know, it's it's a it's a national pride, call it. But yeah, you're saying, Stephen. Yeah, no, it's it's. I think also my mum, my mum didn't always approve because I went when I was like a kid, like five or six years old, with my uncle and and used to come home and like had heard, heard some pretty rude words while I was at the at the game. So I was like, Mum, what does this mean? <laughs> <laughs> Showing that, please. But yeah, that was that was that was really lovely. Um, I also never wore red because that's 
Arsenal, which is the rival team. So I was banned from wearing red for my entire childhood. So it's white and blue, right? That's pretty much the colors of yeah. Tottenham. Pretty... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I don't, I don't own any red clothing. <laughs> I should have seen my shirt for this interview. It's kind of reddish, but yeah, I didn't know. Okay, so let's, uh, let's change the gear. So, uh, okay, then you graduated high school, and what, what's your next station? I guess. Uh, so yeah, went from to Cambridge University um, after high school. Uh, yeah, it was I think really, really interesting experience. I think probably the, hold on, the... Cambridge is like Ivy League. It's like top top of the food chain, no? Yeah. So were you uh, like an excellent student, and you got a scholarship, or uh, what was the premise of you well, going there and not other places? I think well, the good, first of all, the scholarship. The thing about in the UK is that um, at least when I went, I was the last year to get the, the cheaper fees. Um, it was three grand a year capped, so no one could pay more. So any university wow. in the country, which is great. Um, so uh, that was good. Um, I actually was applying for a few universities, so I applied for five. And my history, I applied for history, and my history teacher was like, "You can apply if you want, but there's no way you'll get in." Um, so <laughs> I applied anyway, and luckily because I did get in. Um, Why did you think you're not going to get in for the history route? Uh, I I don't know. Um, I mean, I think I was quite lucky um because we had a couple of interviews um uh so uh, i think there's definitely kind of luck involved but also i think part of the um i enjoyed history but i kind of enjoyed quite um i, I didn't have like a real passion for a certain subject at school um so i chose history just because i needed to choose something and i'm actually really glad, glad i did because although i've not really done any history um since uh like um, history isn't like directly relevant to most careers but particularly e-commerce i think it just taught a lot of like skills which i have um used like uh, almost like time management skills like uh, in my degree we had a had to write an essay every week hold on um, so your degree was a you got a history degree yeah degree was history no, no, um, no kidding a whole degree yeah. about history for what three four years yeah three years so just i think another difference between uk and us is we don't do majors and um other subjects it's just you just choose one thing and that's all you do um which i probably not the best system because we go kind of really deep into one thing and then get no experience of anything else and you decide that when you're 17. so, so once again um, you got a three-year degree from cambridge for his you know history degree three years from cambridge and you think that was actually very beneficial for you that's interesting how you repurpose yeah, that. So I, so go ahead, then. i've forgotten everything um so i can't really remember any of the actual specific like facts that i learn um but uh time management you said you know scheduling time, time yeah management. yeah so i actually met my co the person i've started to tuna with or uh, my first first person that joins the tuna called chris i met him at university um and we used to play football manager um like a yeah, football manager game which we loved and so our goal was how we could maximize the time playing that game and minimize the time writing the essays each week um I came up with loads of, like time management ways to kind of um yeah, get through that, get through as many books as we could in the short, short well, football time. manager is a video game or a physical game? Uh, uh, video game, computer okay, game. Just, yeah. Just making sure. It's okay. Also, the, it's a, it's a computer game, um, but not like, uh, it's not like a, a PlayStation game where you actively play. It's literally, you read emails, look at data and make transfers, which is pretty similar to like Amazon, actually, like what selling ah, on Amazon. Very data driven um, kind of, uh, play. Yeah. So I, think, I think that was probably wow. what I learned more than anything university was that was useful for a career was was, was that game tip um, of the day play football manager if you want to be successful on amazon right yeah probably yeah um very good but yeah actually probably at the time that was that was the most useful part of my degree was the was the game playing but um yeah i think things like time management were really really valuable um it was definitely the most stressful time um of like anything i've done since because of those deadlines um and partially, I think it's also impacted like my career in terms of what I haven't wanted. So I didn't go down things like law or um, like, I guess, uh, big for accounting where you have those similar pressures. Um, because whilst it was a great experience, three years was enough. And I sort of wanted to be able to control my time um, after that, which is one great, th great thing about running a business is that you get a lot more of that control back. Nice. And what year did you graduate? Uh, graduated in 2014. All right. What, what's your next station? What do you do right after uh, university? Or as you say, uni? Yeah. So I, I had no idea what I wanted to do after uni, uh, university. So um, I like had a year 
where I was just trying stuff out. So I was doing some tutoring um, and was uh, actually my first job out of uni was at this art, a Lego art exhibition um, called Art of the Brick that was on Brick Lane. It was, it was a Lego brand or like Lego like? Like as in the, the Lego, the Lego brand is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's it's a wasn't, Lego. It wasn't a brand. It was a guy that just made like pieces of art out of Lego and then displayed them in London. Um, yeah. It's it's and... here too. It's in Atlanta right now. The art of the brick oh, is. Really? Yeah. Okay. I didn't know. I didn't oh, know. Going going some on. places, this guy. Yeah. Yeah. Really still going around. That's so you cool. worked there. What'd you do for them? Uh, I was working in the shop um, and that was actually my first my first foray into like supporting Amazon because um, it came from Belgium and it was already overpriced, obviously. Um, but in the shop, they'd like taken the conversion rate the wrong way around. So it's like, was like a hundred euros. They'd be charging 130 pounds, even though the pound was stronger. So it meant that everything was like three or four times the price on Amazon. So I was kind of in the shop telling everybody like, this is great, but don't buy it here. Go on Amazon to buy it, um, which probably... <laughs> Well, it wasn't there. Why did they um, flip the pricing like that? What was the logic behind that? There was no logic. They just... Just mismanagement? They just did it and that was it. The person who did it was like, well, that's the price now. I'm not changing it again. So they okay. left it like that. Um, but uh, yeah, so it meant I had loads... Of, no one was buying anything, obviously, because it was like so expensive. So I had this like iPad in front of me um, for like eight hours a day. Um, and so that's when I first actually started researching um, different stuff to do and and like ended up coming up with my first Amazon product whilst I was kind of standing there, um, not selling any products and telling people to go on Amazon instead. So hold on. So this is the moment where the Amazon opportunity kind of can, uh, you know, came knocking at your uh, door. Yeah. Well, I, yes. Yeah. I actually had, uh, slightly before that I had a, um, my like very first introduction with e-commerce and Amazon, um, which was, uh, my my first boyfriend's parents um I, so i knew nothing about e-commerce before this point um i was looking for like careers in like politics or civil service or uh like really traditional things that i didn't actually want to do that's was kind of putting it off um and uh they sold doorknobs and that's it they sold like patent doorknobs um and particularly patented? Back in, like, they're patented no patent so it would be doorknobs but they had like um, like spots on them or little rabbits on them or just like a doorknob with a design on. So people yeah, would buy the, them for their There's like... a pen on it? There's a design patent, patent you're saying or no? No, pattern. No, no, no. They had different patterns. patterns. Got it, got it. Okay. Yeah. So like nothing, nothing special at all. Um, and I think before, this is like, like obviously now I think people are really aware that you can get a niche product and make a lot of money with it on Amazon. Um, but in 2015, I think that was more sort of like People would look at it and be like, who's going to buy your doorknob? Um, but they would, they like had a great business out of it. And they were both like the, the, his two parents were, were um, living at home. Um, I remember I went around there on a Wednesday and it was sunny. They're like, oh, should we go to the beach? And we just got in the car and went to the beach on a Wednesday <laughs> afternoon, um, which like, I, I just, I, I really love that. They could just kind of control their own time. Um, and so that kind of, I think, made me realize that what my school and then what Cambridge teaches you I think a lot is that there are like really good careers to go down that's like law accounting consulting civil service like that you you get a job you get promoted and you move up um and this kind of like made me see a different area which is more entrepreneurial and actually kind of having a bit more control over what you do and I I, I really like that well so it sounds like the the e-commerce seeds were planted by um these folks you know that you knew that sold the doorknob you know the uh the, you know, with the patterns but also being in the lego uh, exhibition shop uh telling others to buy on amazon but then starting to kind of do the research so that's kind of how i i see uh, uh the doctor uh, dots are connected and okay so take us to the moment where you i guess launch the product and really uh you know jump into the yeah. pool yeah well i think i, I kind of see a lot of people that i've spoken to now it's like there's a there's two things required to launch launch a brand one is like the desire um but a really big one is just the time and people that are in a job um often just don't get around to doing it i was standing there really bored had nothing else to do and so it kind of pushed me forward um uh, and i got the confidence from i think from the looking at how well, well the doorknobs were doing that pretty much as long as i 
launched it, it probably would work. Um, and so my first product after doing a lot of like, a lot of browsing, um, whilst, whilst, whilst I was working at the shop, um, was uh, a, a product called a button cover, um, which uh, it's like super niche, still really niche. Um, but it was quite good. It was, I think it was a, well, what it was does that a, mean? A, a button cover? Make sure I understand. Yeah. So it was basically um, a cufflink, but that goes over a button on a shirt. So if you have like a, a button like this, you can just clip it mm -hmm. over, f flick it on, and then it looks like a cufflink. Mm -hmm. um, nice. So yeah, super niche, but I think people quite liked it. A lot of people didn't have cufflink shirts, but wanted to put something a bit more interesting on their on on their shirt, and so. Yeah. Um, it was also an ideal first product because they're super small, um, super cheap, unbreakable, don't go off, really niche, no competition. All of these. What like, was the price point? You sell boxes. one for a big markup, or you sell a bundle? One, no, really big markup. So I sold a pair. I bought a pair for like eighty cents, um, and sold them for like uh, like eighteen dollars. Oh wow! Um, so yeah, wasn't high volume, but really nice markup. Um, were were your boyfriend's parents at the time kind of coaching you through this or how did you learn about where to source what were good margins i mean how did you learn all this um yeah so i learned i learned some stuff from them i think there was like a uh crossover so i only had like about four months with them and then i broke up with my boyfriend and lost that lost that um, connection you got lost the mentorship yeah <laughs> lost the advice but um yeah they, they definitely helped quite a bit um and then a lot of like testing i can remember um, I did it quite slowly. I remember I was uh, telling my mum I was going to spend seventy pounds on sending some samples from China, and she was like, "Don't do it; it's a waste of money. You're just going to never get that back." And looking back now, like, if I didn't spend that hundred dollars, basically, then none of this would have happened. Yeah, well, uh, life would have been a uh, difference, like the you know the yeah. pills in the Matrix, right? But yeah, exactly. Um, but was it you launched on Amazon also two thousand fourteen, or was it like also it's like a year ahead already, like two fifteen? Yeah, so I didn't launch till two fifteen, mainly because the Amazon again taking things really slowly. Um, Amazon had a £25 um, subscription fee and eBay was free. So I was like, stick with eBay first, that's free. Um, and then like about nine, 10 months later, I kind of gave Amazon a go and obviously that was- And things were moving on eBay? They were actually selling? Yeah, yeah, they were selling on eBay. Um, I mean, the thing is like, I had the, anyone that's sold on eBay will know the app that, that has the ka sound. So if I sold like, five in a day that's five ka -ching. so it kind of really re-emphasizes that like um uh that high every time you sell something um but yeah it kind of missed that ka -ching. i miss it a little bit yeah yeah definitely <laughs> it heard most fun. and i was also at that point like packaging up myself in my bedroom I had like a little like stand where i was doing it so um like every time i sold one there was like a bit of work beyond it behind it as well um i was like now with fba it's so easy you don't even kind of appreciate each sale that's right well, as you scale okay so take us to the next milestone or next station in this journey um yeah i mean so like i can skip ahead a little bit that was button cuff it actually grew quite well it was in the end i got my grandma involved because that was it was uh it was great it was too much for me to do so then i'd get the packaging from china and the product from china but separate places send it to my grandma and she would sit there on her dining room table like clipping them all together and packaging them up Oh bless! Um, and you know she's which, doing the absolute best job possible because yeah. she wants she wants you to be successful. You That's should call that the the brand like Grandma's Touch or something. The brand, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I should have probably filmed it. Filmed it, yeah. But she um, yeah, she did a great job. But the problem is, I had to like, she was doing it for like a year and a half, and then the brand was growing and growing, and it was fine when we were selling like I don't know fifty a month, um, but it got to the point where we we're selling about. 800 a month and that's a that's a, a lot of work for an 80 year old woman so i oh, had yeah. to outsource that to in the end i got them packaged in china and then my grandma didn't have a job anymore but she, she was she able to find another retired 80 years plus you know, yeah exactly <laughs> yeah okay good um uh but yeah so that, that that grew quite a bit and then i actually got a job at amazon um so still had button cuff and then started working at amazon in the uk office hold on how um, did this happen which well, what's your I history degree job. from uh, Cambridge and selling a uh, uh, it seems uh what happened there? Well, Take us to that, yeah. I think I needed a job. Like I'd uh, art of the brick had only had, had closed down and um, probably wanted a, a change on that. I actually had a job in between, so I had art of the brick, which I didn't have anything to do, and then I had a job at a PR company. Um, 
but this PR company was again quite an interesting experience. Um, it was I was the, the first employee, and he hired one other person. And basically, he was the the owl, the, the guy that hired us was hired me was um, like an advisor to like a few Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. So a guy called Tony Fidel, who uh, founded Nest, invented the iPhone. Um, and at the time was like a SVP at Google and previously an SVP at Apple. So like really, uh, really kind of intelligent. Um, and our role, my role was as a researcher was to kind of talk to um, different startups um, that he might want to invest in. So I'd talk to their CEO or to their, um, someone in their team and get some information about them. Um, so that was really great exposure um, to the startup world. Um, I did that for about a year and a half. Uh, which I really, really enjoyed. But again, like for a full time, there wasn't very much work. So I spent a lot of time at that job, which probably shouldn't say I'm recording, but spent a lot of time at that job, also running my Amazon business, probably more than half the time. Um, and then in, at the end thought, well, I'm spending all my time doing Amazon anyway. So why not see if I can apply for a job there and and kind of at least uh, legitimately get paid to, to work with Amazon. Um, so what so year yeah, was that I, when you got uh, hired by Amazon? Uh, that was 20, I don't even remember now, uh, 2016, 2016, 2017. Um, yeah, it was end of 2016, I think. So I got hired by Amazon. Um, and what did you do? The, what was your role? Uh, my role, so I was hired on the heavy bulky team, which is the best name. Um, so it was in the marketplace team. So it was kind of a, a hybrid role between working with new sellers to get them on the marketplace and, and helping them grow. So kind of a very much direct working with sellers. Um, and then also helping set up a specific program for really big products. So like fridges, mattresses, washing machines, like how customers could get a fridge next day on Amazon, which st still isn't solved. Um, <laughs> but yeah. it's, I think after six years, it's better than it was when I, I first started. Um, that was really interesting because it wasn't just a sales role. It was also quite operations focused. Um, so I was talking to like two man delivery careers, people that would deliver the products and yeah, the last out. mile delivery is probably a big challenge. It's not like a toothpaste where you can, you know, it's, it's all around you and you can always, uh, make it happen yeah. same day of the delivery, but a side question, yeah. did you ever come across Max and Claire? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were in the same, I know Max quite well. We were in the same team. There we go. So check hey. out Max and Claire's episode. Yeah. I smell yeah, some, content. uh, cross collaboration. Yeah. E -com -com -com. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's doing great. I think his, um, his idea we've, we've used the tool as well and the idea is really good he's he's doing very well i was actually just at his office last week of course this is months ago when this airs um but he has a lot of really exciting updates coming up so they're doing quite well yeah awesome all right so amazon how long were you there or what, any major milestones or uh i was there for just under two years um really enjoyed it really really loved it um but pretty major milestone whilst I was there is I founded, I started another Amazon brand. So I still had button cuff, but started another one called Beachmore Books um, with a guy called Sam Horby, who is the co-founder of Old Sam now. Hold on, um, hold on. So yeah, Sam was, oh, he also worked for Amazon, right? Yeah. So Sam worked for Amazon um, at the same time as me. He was in the B2B team, but we sat opposite each other. Um, Got it. And you guys opened a brand together, you say? Yeah, so Amazon. You, time, so you were out of Amazon, but he was still there, or you already also kind of uh, moved out? No, so at the time we were both at Amazon. Um, we started the brand. Um, again, they start off really small, so the it, it was like a, a just a, a thing we wanted to try, um, but it was going quite well. I and effectively, I decided after sort of like almost two years that all I wanted to do was run my own brand, and I was then the same pattern. I had a new job, which was Amazon this time, and spending most of my time actually doing Sorry, my own brand know. rather than <laughs> my actual job it was easier this time because i would have amazon open they'd be like oh steven's working really hard for his sellers <laughs> it, was, it was just me but um uh yeah like i think at that point i kind of decided that if i was trying to spend all my time doing something that could be a career then maybe i should just take the leap and see if i can turn that into a career um so i had Beach more books, button cuff, and then thought, well, I'll see what happens and um, left Amazon. I was so nervous to resign. I mean, my, my manager, like after I resigned, she bought me like a giant hot chocolate with loads of marshmallows on it because I looked so nervous. 
<laughs> that's so precious. You only that's like when I when I left Noviland to come to Gatita, I was sobbing, but telling Francois while I was leaving. I get it. Because you like there's nothing wrong with the job. You just want to do something different. It's hard. And especially when you like your boss, that transition's really difficult to make. Yeah, I really loved everybody. And um I've actually a few people I'm still in touch with quite a lot of them and a few people from Amazon have since joined me at Citruna. So like made some like really great friends. Um but yeah, I, it was, I miss people there, but it was definitely the right decision for me to, to kind of, to, to leave. And this is already 2018, right? When you make the move and basically you go solo on, and, and, and jump in on, you know, expanding your brands. Yes. Yeah, so my last day was Christmas Eve on 2018. That was my final day at Amazon. Mm, so you reset for 2019 and then, okay. So, uh, and you still one of the brands is with uh, Sam, right? Uh, and yeah, yeah, take us, take us to the next station. Yeah. So I, I kind of left not really knowing exactly what I wanted to do which I think up until that time was like the theme. I was just seeing what worked. Um, but I had Button Cuff, which was making uh, a little bit, Beachmore Books, it was growing a little bit more. Um, and I thought I'll just focus on that. So I left, did that for a little bit. And then I actually remember on, uh, this is where Citruna came from, on Valentine's Day, um, after I left, I was bored, nothing to do, um, no partner. Um, and so I went on Upwork and uh, I came across a job post from a French, company that was trying to get investment and they had a problem with like an Amazon listing blocked or something um and they were like we'll pay a thousand dollars if you can fix it and it was incredibly easy to fix so I fixed it in like less than two minutes they were like great here's a thousand dollars the easiest money I've ever earned but I was like no, I should probably do this a bit more um so like from from that day from 14th of Feb by uh 2019 that's kind of where Citruna Citru the Caesar Citruna came from started doing a little bit more in my spare time um I really enjoyed it like working with sellers um and so then I kind of had these three three streams of of button cuff Beachmore books and Citruna um so tell us about the name for a moment if we can uh pause for a second tell us so how yeah, did the name come from um name so it actually is quite not your grandmother's name right uh, the, the one with making the cufflinks it's not it's it's Finnish um oh, it means lem it means lemon in Finnish um, oh, citrus citruna I, oh it makes sense yeah i was called lemon and that was my nickname in school so for like 15 years i was called lemon um, why is that yeah. is there any any story behind that or it just happened to be i don't know it, it was like from primary school i don't even know what the like it, there's no kind of like one story it just became a nickname um that like followed me all the way through into university um but my uh my my dad when he worked in woolworths like i like kind of wanted to copy him and so I had this idea when I was like a 10 year old that I'd create a shop and it was like the shop would be called Lemons and it would sell everything except lemons was like the little tagline. <laughs> um, so, so Woolworth like, is a, just a touch on that. It's a famous department store in the UK. It's still active, right? No. So it, it went bust in, in the 2008 recession. Is it related like to a, the American one or no? You know, got no idea. I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah the Woolworth not... building in the hand that Woolworth used to be, you know, the, the department store also went bankrupt. Yeah. Uh, back in the day in the United States. I wonder if they're related or not, but if they are, yeah, I won't be surprised, but if not, well, it'll be a it was, surprising it like thing if, that, yeah. Yeah, it was like a little, it was it was a little shop on like every every high street that had like pick a mix and like CDs and like little toys and all stuff. Yeah, it's like a general, store. yeah, it's like a department yeah. store, yeah, it, this it, kind of stuff. It looks like they were the same. Yeah, was so it? I think the one, one in the UK outlived the one in the US. I think that, you know, the, the band yeah, probably was, ran a few more years. I used to, because as a kid, because I bought my toys, I used to think my dad just played games all day. Like he just played with toys all day. That's so right. I was jealous when he went to work. But um, yeah, that's what got, that's what gave me the idea. Um, I like it. Great I, name, by the way. Beautiful. Yes. Nice. But, but when when you decided that you were going to do more of this, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. You found your kind of your first flip, that first thousand dollars on Upwork. Is that where you continued to go to to build out this agency base, or how did you do that? Yeah. So at the start, it was just Upwork, and it was a lot smaller. Um, because it wasn't really the aim to like build an agency. Um, I kind of still want to do the brands and, and um, I always enjoy doing the brands more. Um, but I had Chris, the guy I went to uni with, was working at an, um, at an agency um, called Peris Merkel Periscopics, which is like a really big um, like digital marketing Google agency in the UK. Um, and I was going to him for advice and he was helping me on what to do. Um, and then in the end, I was like, well, do you want to come to join me and uh and run this agency um so this was like 
about six to eight months in and he's really risk averse and was also getting married. So he was like, I would love to, but I can't because he needs a stable job. So I then, uh, this was way before aggregators. I heard about empire flippers and how you could like sell brands. So I listed a uh, button cuff um, to try and sell it um, as a way to get enough money to then hire. Jumpstart, um, yeah, they just didn't hire a talent. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I managed to get, I managed to sell this brand for enough for like a year's salary for, for Chris. Wow. Um, so, did, so did that, which was, which was really lucky because um, it gave him the confidence to, to join. And what year within was that? Like, that was all 2019 when he sold that brand? Yeah, this was all 2019. So within like eight months since leaving Amazon, which I'd sold button cuff and, and, and hired, hired Chris, uh, or well, Chris had joined. Um, we then within three weeks had spent all the money that we sold button cuff for. So the idea of keeping it in a bank account didn't really work, but, <laughs> um, yeah, but it, it worked anyway. Um, yeah. And then, and then I think from that point, even though the aim wasn't to build an agency, it sort of like just carried on growing because we had the expertise, we had the demand. And if someone's saying, I'll pay you money to do this, like we weren't turning it down. Um, and we kind of accidentally started building processes to make things easier in order to not do the job. So we were like, we don't want to do this. So we'll try and like automate it. And then that automation meant it was easier to take on more and more profitable. Um, so it just kept on growing from there. And um, that became more and more of the focus um, and more and more of kind of the team we built. So since 2019, we've kind of hired quite significantly on the, um, on the, uh, on the Citroen on the consulting side. Um, and jumping ahead a little bit, I then l last year decided to sell Beachmore Books. It's now fully focused on on helping brands and, and on the consulting. So in other words, you cashed out of uh, your retail and brand positions, and now you're you know fully focused and immersed and immersed in the you know servicing the brands out there and, and your clients. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, they're they're very different um, kind of types of businesses to run, um, and I think it was really fun when you're growing them to grow them both, but they both get to a stage, I think, where like I had a great idea where you'd have like product business bringing in certain types of revenue and service business building, like funding the team to then grow the product. And it kind of sounded great in theory, but I think it actually gets to the stage where like, if you want to grow a product business to five or $10 million, or you want to grow a service businesses to one, two, 300 clients, that needs a full focus, right? If, if I'm splitting my time, just both of them get a bit of an average um, kind of average outcome. success mm -hmm. yeah average outcome so i was like really trying to from last year focus down and say like this consulting is going really well we're helping lots of really cool brands so and, and and also like the team like got a really good enjoyable team that i work with 30 people now um, 30 three zero yeah yeah 30 so 30 wow. of us how um, how was that transition going from being exclusively your own boss or yours and grandma's boss and running these brands to now having a team of 30 people that you're leading? Yeah, really good question. Cause, um, I, like, I think I, I enjoy working with people, but I definitely prefer if I was at a company, I much prefer being like an independent contributor to it versus like a team manager. Mm -hmm. Um, and when it's your business, like it becomes more and more just about team management. Um, so one of the best things that I've done was um, hire people that want to do the stuff that I don't want to do. Um, so I'm a bit of an introvert and like people like say to me, um, oh, the two, the only two things a founder should be doing are sales and kind of leading your team. Um, but actually, you know, I love stuff like process improvement and delivery and um, data and, and things that people don't necessarily include in the, in the, in the standard, like this is what a founder should be doing. Um, so I've hired, uh, in, in 2020, um, a guy called Mike, who's now the managing director of Satuna. Um, he was actually at Amazon for five years. And interestingly, he was the account manager, uh, that was assigned to button cuff when I first launched that on Amazon. Um, so I kind of like met him many years ago, um, for that. And then he, he came across to Amazon, to Satuna from Amazon, um, and has taken that a lot of that res responsibility of like the, the client team management, um, which has been great because it's allowed me to kind of focus on my strengths and allowed us to grow to a team of 30 um, mm -hmm. without having that kind of like, um, I guess, tension of like, is this what I want to be doing? Is, is this what I'm good at? 
Yeah. It felt more like organic, uh, the transitioning. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what, exactly. what an application like there's no better resume than I can run Amazon businesses. You know this. I was your account manager. Like what an <laughs> what an easy transition and like conversation to have. Yeah, I mean, it was incredible to that 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 Mike, I think we're really lucky that he joined us. Um, and we've actually had this with a few people that have joined. Um, not everybody, I think, particularly kind of over and then post COVID people want to work hard and wants success but also want like a recognition that there's some stuff that's more important than work or like important to fit alongside work um and i think uh you often don't get that at big companies like amazon obviously people have different experiences but a lot of people have had quite negative experiences there and a lot have had positive but um the same in some other marketing agencies that people have come from and joined to tuna and so a big focus we've had is like we want to be really successful um, but equally, we want to make sure that people enjoy working here and can prioritize sort of like stuff that's important to them, like their families, um, which generally doesn't actually get in the way of someone miss, has to miss a day for a family thing or a, a medical thing, whatever. That doesn't actually impact any any contribution to your work, but has a massive impact to your your, your own life. And so um, we've been quite lucky in that by... Um, focusing on that and making sure it's a really nice enjoyable place for people to work we've managed to hire people that are like really really great like really experienced really strong loads of have loads of previous experience but aren't necessarily looking to kind of build on that with um a big company they want to go to a, a small company um and yeah that's 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 been really great for us so culture it sounds like you you know there's a importance of, of, for you and your team to have some sort of a culture where you, you know you're all professional you all get everything done but when you know life uh, happens uh there's a priority for that and there's a space and room to to take care of your life and then once you you know ready to go back into the professional uh, uh chamber uh you do so so it's it's a balancing of things and and it's there's a deliberate um thought and craftsmanship of that but I, my question to you is i know you're the founder but today was your actual role would you say or your position yeah <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, I'm always trying to make myself redundant. I think that's the first thing. So I'm always trying to like say. So you're like a I spiritual don't... figure, or? Well, it's still loads that I have to do, but we're getting it's it's getting less. So like, um, there'll be things that I'll, I'll I will have historically done, and then try and hand over to, hand over to someone. Interestingly, I went to Vietnam for two months um, at the beginning of this year, um, and that was our most successful, profitable, highest growth two months we've ever had. Um, so I'm not sure what that tells you, but um, kind of when I left the business, everything went really well. Um, I think effectively my role at the moment is on um, helping the direction of the company, the strategy. Um, I manage some clients, some of our biggest clients I manage directly. Um, and then a lot of the process improvement, um, we've just actually launched a new dashboard, um, which is a, like a data service for our clients, which is really cool. We're building like a chat GPT integration so that you can just ask it and say, hey, what were my sales for this product for this week or whatever? Because um, you notice a lot of people don't want to look, don't don't know SQL, don't want to look through spreadsheets and, and dashboards. So we just like, we just ask, ask effectively you ask a, ask chat GPT, it, that writes a query, pulls the data. Um, so being oh, able so to develop stuff like through that. the chat GPT vessel you ask, but you get the chat GPT gets the answers and the relevant data from your systems and it which yes. is relevant for the client. That's pretty, pretty remarkable. Yeah. It's really cool. Actually. It's something we want to launch more widely in the next sort of probably not sure I should announce this on this, but anyway, it's, it's kind of a, a really fun thing that, that, that I've been doing. Um, so kind of just finding projects that will improve the company, improve the client experience, um, and will kind of move us forward. Um, probably the biggest one we've done this year, which is the most recent, I guess, big update in, Citruna and I guess my my journey probably um, is I've always enjoyed kind of logistics and operations. Um, that's why I did a lot at Amazon in the heavy bulky program. Um, and it's always been a massive problem. Like with Beachmore Books, the biggest reason we didn't sell more was that we had stock in the wrong place or we didn't have enough stock or Amazon were like, we're going to just not let you send anything else in randomly. They just put limits on um, and there was always problems. And so we worked with a 3PL that was great, um, worked with them for a few years. And then about four months ago, we kind of uh, uh, invested, acquired them 
um, and added that. So Citrino Logistics is now uh, a service that we offer under our agency, which is a fully fledged 3PL. Um, and that's really fun. That's something that I'm, I'm able to do because I'm not fully focused on sort of like the day-to-day -day running of Citrino. I can do um, kind of other projects and it's really helped. We've got loads of clients now that were struggling a lot um, with the fulfillment side of, um, of Amazon and of e-commerce and we're able to say, we can actually solve that for you. We can make sure you stay in stock. We can manage all your shipments and everything else. Um, and it's fun because there's so many processes to work out that I, that's, that's the bit I really enjoy. Yeah, so it sounds like, you know, you guys are, you know, doing some vertical integration. So congratulations on that. That's, that's pretty remarkable. A uh, few questions I have in mind. Um, I guess, well, to, 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 you know, a quick one. How, you know, did you purchase it, you know, yourself or with your own funding or you had to kind of uh, go go to get a loan for that? That's on the on the 3PL side. But uh, if, I'm an, um, if I'm a seller of a brand, what's a typical profile that, you know, it's a really perfect fit for Citruna? Is it somebody that kind of wants to launch or somebody already launched and things are wobbly or somebody is already launched and they're doing a few million and you could take them and scale them? What's a typical spectrum of, of, uh, of uh, fitting for, for, you know, for uh, uh, Citruna? So I guess it's a, it's a loaded uh, package of questions here. Yeah, I mean, on that on the second question, we we work with like a really wide range so we have um some uh multinational brands like we're working with hp we're working with um like the, the computer company we're working with dole international uh, we did a project for jack daniels so some really big brands wow absolutely. But we also work yeah we also work with some like small like one-man bands um that have great products um and they're just just amazon sellers that, that are trying to kind of create successful businesses out of that one channel. Um, but I guess the, the the one key thing that they all have in common is that we really want to work with brand owners that have great products. Um, so we don't work with sort of resellers or people that sort of just want to find, um, which is a good business model, but one that we don't find we can add so much to is when you um, just buy anything and try and sell on Amazon and, 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 and make margin there. Um, we found we, we, we work best when you've got a great brand. Um, in terms of size, we love working with brands that are are growing in general, um, but often that could mean you're very, you're totally new to Amazon, but you have retail or D2C or other channels where you've got some sales and you want to come to Amazon, that's great. We can launch you there. Um, or people that are on Amazon and kind of want to change. So they want to overhaul their advertising or their logistics. They want to kind of get to the next level and we can kind of come in and, and, and help there. Um, that's great. Yeah, and I think part of our ethos really is because because when I was running Barton Cuff, we had to, sorry, be, or Barton Cuff and Beachmore Books, we had to do everything. We've tried to replicate that in Citruna. So rather than just doing advertising or just doing like operations, if you're a brand, we can hopefully help you in all the areas um, relevant to Amazon, or we can refer you to people like Athida if there's an area we don't cover. Um, we've got great partners. So um, that's kind of how we aim to work. Got it. I remember how you mentioned where you had to sell a brand to hire, you know, your team member, but now mm. you bought a 3PL. So, so things have progressed financially for you. So how, yeah. you know, on, on the finances <laughs> side, what was the structure for you? Uh, you had to sell so, something to buy the 3PL or things were yeah. just going okay, or you had to get a loan or what was the format? So sold another brand. That's the, really? That's the, yeah. So that we sold Beachmore books. Oh, um, yeah, there you go. Which was, um, that was sad because I sort of like run Beachmore books. Um, uh, for, uh, that was like my, I mean, Barton Cuff was the first business, Beachmore Books was the first kind of real big one. Um, so it's sad to let it go. Um, but uh, we actually still do some work with them, with the new owners, um, which is which is really nice. Um, but yeah, so I think you're the first person great. I met that sold the brand to buy a 3PL. That's, uh, I can really, uh, you know, give you uh, the kudos for that. Um, wow, well, well done. Very, very impressive. Lisa, you want to add? Go ahead. I was just going to ask, you know, since we kind of already went over like the ICP and and your, you know, scope of work, uh, where is the three PL? Where are your clients largely based out of? You know, who can you work with like locationally, internationally? Yeah, where in the world? Yeah, I mean, we have I'd say probably just over half our clients are in the UK. So we've got obviously a lot of experience here. A lot of the team is based in the UK, um, but the other half of the clients are spread some American clients, quite a few in uh, in Middle East and Australia, actually, um, some in Europe. So like we're, 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 we're very spread. I think as a UK agency, 
if um, if a brand wants to launch in the UK or Europe, we're particularly strong there because we've got the logistics arm, which really helps. Um, we've got connections with accountants for that, etc. Um, but we're not sort of like a UK only. We're, it's a global agency. Um, and I, I mean, for Beachwell Books, I sold in every every Amazon country there was. I made sure Beachwell Books was there, um, and that's meant we've tried it all out. And then with our clients as well, it's it, it that's continued. Um, yeah, so got, got it. So my question on your the, the brands you sold, you typically see, I mean, I guess the first one you sold wasn't for an aggregator because it was kind of before the aggregator boom. But uh, the books, the beach books, um, you sold that to an aggregator or, or was it more strategic? Yeah, so neither were an aggregator. Um, what, the beach books were sold to a, a guy in uh, uh, to, to a company in America, in, in America, um, which was really nice. It's like a family we sold it to. Um, so uh, like a business that that the nice thing about that is they have a lot of focus on it and on the brand and on growing that specific brand. Um, I think with aggregators, obviously they've, they've kind of got a lot of benefits of, of, of scale, um, but um, it's really nice to see sort of like a full focus on like how Beachmore Books can be as good, as, as strong as possible from the people who bought it because it's their one brand. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a bit more of a passion for them and focus to really drive it to the next level. Yeah, which is really nice to see. Nice, and, and it's going well. They've, they've, they've done very well since the acquisition, so that's good. It's great to hear. Okay, so let's uh, package this all up and take it to the next level. Go ahead, Denisa. Yeah, so we're going to move into the final phase here, which is a recap, and then we will learn where folks can learn more about Citruna. Uh, and then we're going to hear a quick last message from you, Stephen. So just to kind of recap everything, um, originally from London, one sister who always wanted to be a nurse and ended up living out that dream in the hospital she wanted to work in, which is such a blessing. Uh, mom was a teacher and dad had a couple different jobs, but ended up landing in IT. Growing up, didn't really have a clear idea of what she wanted to do, enjoyed playing football, but say you weren't super good at it. Um, ended up graduating high school and going to University of Cambridge for a history degree. And throughout university, really learned a lot by, by playing that management game, learned a lot about time management and how can we spend less time on essays and more time playing this game. Uh, graduated in 2014, still didn't really know what you wanted to do. Took a year to really try some stuff out like tutoring and got your first job out of university at the Lego art exhibit, the art of the brick. Um, also worked for a PR firm as well, kind of everything overlapping. Um, while at the art of the brick, you were seeing someone whose parents were selling on Amazon. You knew about their business and you saw the opportunity for products we sold on Amazon, the art of the brick too, actually telling people, Hey, yes, that's super cute. Don't buy it here. You can get it on Amazon. So you had lots of time on your hands. You knew how an Amazon business worked. You were kind of leaning on them a little bit for coaching. So started, uh, your Amazon business on eBay first. So we, I guess we can say e-com business on eBay first, and then launched an Amazon in 2015 with the um, button cuffs, the button covers. Um, and that business did quite well, ended up hiring on grandma to do the packaging until it became, uh, greater than her capabilities. So you started doing packaging in China and spending your time at these two jobs, working on your Amazon business said, well, I might as well just go work for Amazon. So joined the Amazon UK office at the end of 2016 hybrid role between getting new sellers on the marketplace and helping them grow and also helping to build the heavy and bulky, you know, program, trying to get fridges to folks next day, et cetera. Uh, worked there for just under two years. And one of the major milestones you had while you worked there was launching your second brand, which is Beachmore books, um, spending a lot of time while at Amazon, still working on the stores and eventually, right before the end of 2018 said, I'm just going to go full in on running my Amazon businesses. Um, Valentine's 2019, we're just not doing a whole lot. Nope. Like you said, no partner, weren't out at dinner or anything, searching on Upwork and came across a French company that needed help with a listing. And they said a thousand dollars if you can fix it. And it took you two minutes. So that kind of sparked the idea for Citrino of saying, okay, I can help people with these different tasks that they need done. So helping some other folks on Upwork with these quick flips, um, ended up selling button cuff to Empire Flippers so that you could hire Chris so that you could really start Citruna and ended up selling Beachmore books in 2022 
to buy the 3PL to now have Citrino Logistics. Again, this is a very unique thing that we haven't heard on this store on this uh, show before. Um, but now running, you know, Citrino, an agency with over 30 people on your team and really a best fit for you guys is somebody with a strong brand that's really wanting to grow instead of just like grabbing a random product and selling it. So somebody who's kind of all in invested in the business like like you were prior to, to your exits. Um, is that kind of an accurate wrap up of everything for you, Stephen? Yeah, yeah, pretty. You squeeze beautiful. the lemon dry. Pretty comprehensive, yeah. Then, yeah. <laughs> so uh, last stages here are going to be one, where can folks reach out and learn more about Citruna and reach out to you if they have any questions? Um, yeah, sure. So our, our website, citruna.com, um, or uh, my email address, I think Stephen at citruna.com, um, if you want to kind of get in touch. Um, yeah, on the bottom there. If you're listening to this, it's Stephen with S T E P H E N at yes. Citruna. Citruna is S I C T R U N A dot com. So that's kind of the spelling of just listening to this instead of just watching. Thank yep. you, Yoni. Yeah, Citruna.com is the website. Stephen at Citruna.com is his email address. And then the last thing we're going to do here, Stephen, is we would love to hear from you your message of hope or inspiration for entrepreneurs that are listening. Uh, yeah, well, uh, on the spot, I think um, I've really loved everything I've done. Um, and I think part of the driving factor of what I've done is what I enjoy. Um, it's not been necessarily about like trying to make as much money as possible or try and grow as big as possible. It's about doing things that I really enjoy with friends, people I really enjoy working with. Um, and yeah, I've, I've loved it so far. And I guess for anyone listening that's either running a business or thinking about running a business, I would say that... Um, there's obviously loads of planning and loads of work that goes into it. Um, but for me, at least, the thing that's kind of been the real driving factor is like recognizing this is the thing that I really want to do, I really enjoy doing. Um, and that's always, I think, going to be a far better motivator than sort of uh, what you've heard is the best new idea or what you should do. Um, mm. So, yeah, I, I think follow what you love or follow what you enjoy. Um, and that's always a really great place to start. But, Wonderful. What's the Beautiful. phrase? If you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. Is that what mm -hmm. they say? There you go, yeah. <laughs> Let your love and passion for things and people and environments, you know, drive you. Uh, and you'll probably find a lot of financial success if, if you follow that, you know, formula. Exactly. So well, well puts you. Yes. Definitely. Steven, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your story with us today. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. And thank you so much for everybody who tuned in today. If you guys liked what you heard, please be sure to give us a thumbs up, share your thoughts with us in the comments, subscribe to the show, and we will see you on the next one.